Thanks for coming. Uh, today, is, uh, today we're going to talk about architecting well-rounded and evolvable data platforms. And the reason uh, I chose this, uh, um, the topic name was that it had a perfect score for clickbaitiness. Uh, so yeah, you get easily selected and get in. All right, my name, my name is uh, Arun. Uh, I'm a data engineer at ThoughtWorks. Um, I've built a few data platforms, uh, which is uh, not only known within uh, the banking industry, but it's also uh, uh, very popular outside as well. I'm author of two outdated books. Uh, on Spark, uh, unless you're looking for hard pillows, I, I don't, I don't see why you should buy them. Um, I'm an expert in making awkward conversations. Uh, if you're, um, uh, I mean, if you if you have a, a career ambition around making awkward conversations, I think you should come and talk to me. Um, all right. Uh, so, so when I propose this topic, I've, I've wanted to cover a lot of things. Uh, I wanted to talk about metadata and lineage tracking, storage formats and schema evaluation, retention reconciliation, uh, the multi-tenancy and this and that and this stuff. So. Uh, Instead of talking a lot of uh, things and a little bit of those things, uh, what I decided to do is to just talk about two critical pieces which I thought is important. Uh, one is metadata and lineage tracking, which is which predominantly people call as data governance. And the second part, uh, part of it is the storage formats and schema evolution. Uh, I believe everyone should uh, uh, understand their storage formats internally to come up and decide what, what is best suited for their own data platform. All right? um, all right, but before uh, before we go into the juice of the talk, I have like seven slides of really fluffy uh, uh, discussions wherein we are going to talk about where does these metadata and lineage tracking or storage formats and schema evaluation fit into the entire uh, data ecosystem, all right? Um, so uh, I'm pretty sure if uh, anyone familiar, the who, who here are actually working with data? Uh, all right, I mean, uh, there's a lot of hesitance on raising their hands. I'm not going to punish you guys. Um, so. Uh, this, this is something which you have seen at all familiar, right? I mean, we have structured data, we have uh, semi-structured data, we have binary data, uh, we have unstructured data, which I forgot to put in here. Uh, but uh, we have a whole lot of data, and then uh, all we try to do is to uh, bring all the data into the data lake. And the way that we bring into the data lake is that uh, we wanted to retain the data assets from the source. We don't want to touch, we don't want to do a lot of transformations, we, do, we obviously wanted to do a, a, some bit of a validation, but there's no, we don't want to do, uh, do a lot of touching on the data itself. And uh, this is the uh, data lake, right? And from the data lake, we, uh, in traditional organizations, what we try to do is to come up with uh, one unified view of uh, what an organization is, what a party is, what a customer is. And, and we wanted to put them into some kind of a strict uh, representation of the entity, and which we call as data warehouse, right? Uh, so typically, data warehouses are built on uh, RDBMS databases. Uh, but, uh, and this is how it typically looks like. I mean, this is, uh, the, this is actually stolen from uh, FSLDM, if, if you're familiar with that. The financial services logical data model. Uh, this is typically what these uh, banks are implementing in. So they, they put the data into the data lake, and from there they extract the relevant content. Uh, the, because when they when they ingest into a data lake, they have credit card application, they have uh, personal loan application, they have housing loan application, and, and they wanted to have one view of what a customer is, and they wanted to have one view of what a campaign is, and all those things. So this is the a logical data model. That's the, that's what they uh, do typically from the data that is taken from data lake. They try to build a data warehouse out of. It. And then we have something called the data marts. Data marts are, uh, are more granular uh, uh, in the sense that they have a very uh, granular view of what an entity must be. And say, for example, let's take an example of finance. Uh, we have something, we have a specific uh, notion of what a bills receivable is, what an invoice is, uh, and what a transaction is, and all these things. Um, and this is, uh, I mean, you would be, you'd be asking the question why, I mean, if, if data warehouse is not granular, we are not capturing a lot of data in the data warehouse, how would magically um, uh, more data come into the data Mart. Uh, typically, we have mm, several different applications which is ingesting into the data mart itself. But this is this is not what we are going to talk about today at all. What we're going to actually talk about are the lines. All right, uh, these lines are what we call as the data pipelines. Right, so we, we take the data from the source and then we put into data lake, or we take the data from the data lake and we try to structure it and put into data warehouse. And these lines are what are called as data pipelines. Right, and when we zoom into these data pipelines, uh, we see that this is the this is a general structure that we see in the data pipeline. Uh, we receive the data. Uh, we do some kind of a transformation or enrichment. Say, for example, we populate from a, a different data set, and then we try to we join them with the current data set, and then we try to enrich it. Or we do some kind of transformation. Say, for example, if you're if you're ingesting a data from uh, several different databases, each database has its own uh, view of what a data type is, uh, or how, how a date should look like. Uh, and so we wanted to unify them into one single go, and that's a minimal kind of transformation we do 
uh, when we are ingesting into a data lake. And then we try to validate. Validate is where we try to um, uh, say uh, stick uh, a column uh, to a specific data type and so on. And then we obviously store. I mean, the whole point of running the data pipeline is to store, right? And the whole point of storing is to serve the data to the customer. But, but this, is, uh, this is something which uh, everyone in the data world uh, obviously knows. So what we are going to talk about today is that, uh, and then uh, throughout these data pipelines, we have something called as a cross-cutting concerns. We have underneath, at every single stage of the data pipeline, uh, we try to capture the metadata. Uh, and then we also wanted to capture the lineage. So uh, what does lineage mean? We'll look at it uh, in a short while. But uh, we wanted to capture how this data arrived at this particular place, uh, whatever data that we're looking at. Uh, so Metadata and lineage is the, uh, is the second topic uh, that we're going to, uh, the first topic that we're going to talk about, and that is the cross-cutting concern at the bottom, all right? And storage formats, which is the second part of the talk, which is coming into the store, the green box uh, side of it. We're not going to talk about anything at all. We're, not, uh, we're just completely going to ignore that the rest of them exist, all right? So that's the end of the uh, part one of the fluffy talk, and we have two more slides of the fluffy one. Uh, so. Uh, what is metadata and lineage? Um, we know that metadata is data about the data. I mean, this is, uh, this is something which uh, everyone would, uh, would know, right? So uh, we wanted to capture, for whatever data that we are storing in the data lake, we wanted to capture um, the data about the data that is ingested. Say, for example, if you are actually storing uh, image inside the data lake, we wanted to uh, store information around what this image is about, uh, and uh, say who is, uh, what is the relevance of this image according to the business. So these are the uh, these are the uh, data that we would be typically capturing. But 90% of the data that we have in the organization is tabular, right? So we're just going to talk about tables. All right. So. If you're, if you're trying to capture uh, the data type about tables, uh, what, are the data type, uh, what are the metadata that we would typically type, try to capture? I mean, what is the table name? And what is the business description of the table name? Uh, what is the column name? And uh, what, is the, uh, what is the semantic meaning of this column name in the first place? What is the data type of the column name? And who is the, uh, from, from whom did we source this uh, data, uh, the table data itself? And uh, who are the owners of this data? And who are we? Uh, who are the consumers of our data? And when we are storing the data, we can't live forever, and we can't store it forever because of storage reasons and several other reasons. Uh, so we wanted to know how long are we going to store this data, and then uh, who, then we're going to say, and over a period of time, we would be changing the uh, scheme of this table uh, over a period of time. So we wanted to know what is the different. When was the last time this version has changed? And uh, even historically, we wanted to know when was this, uh, when, when was the scheme actually, when did the scheme actually change? All right. So that's the metadata side of it. Okay. Um, for the lineage side of it, oh, okay, sorry. Um, so he, who uses this metadata? So the data stewards or the data owners uh, are the ones who are uh, who uses this metadata. Uh, say predominantly when they when they when they wanted to change the schema or they wanted to know uh, who are all the people who are affected by this change in schema. Uh, so this is the data steward, and then uh, they they also wanted to uh, capture this information in order to. This, this becomes easy for them to uh, report to the regulators that uh, we have the schema. This is all the data that, that data that we have. Uh, so you can you can actually look at it. Uh, so we, we, when the regulators come and and ask, say, ask us, uh, what are all the PI information that you have in your data set? Uh, instead of just asking every single application, we have one single place wherein we can say that, okay, this is the PI data, this is the entire data set that we have, and this, this, this subset of this is the PI data. Um, and for data scientists and analysts, this, this is the marketplace. The metadata store is a marketplace. Metadata store is where we have metadata of all the uh, data that we have throughout uh, the organization. I mean, uh, hopefully. Um, so uh, this becomes a uh, marketplace for data scientists and analysts, for them to uh, shop for features in order to uh, build their models, or for analysts in order to come up with an aggregated analysis. Um, and then this is, uh, this is an interesting bit, uh, the 360-degree applications. Who, who, who here are familiar with the 360-degree applications? Um, all right. Uh, so in large organizations, what people do is that they have, uh, say, for example, let's take this uh, banking client, the private banking client, right? The private banking client just means that they are really, really rich. And they wanted to invest uh, across the world. Uh, so, and they wanted to invest in different kind of uh, assets. So uh, say, for example, a, a rich person in New York would like to invest in real estate in Thailand and uh, equities in uh, Singapore or uh, funds in Japan and so on. But 
within a bank, each of these country level um, uh, things are different entities. So obviously this client has to, to be onboarded into different countries now. Uh, now in order to come up with one unified view of the net worth of this private banking client, uh, we have to source all this information from different applications uh, in order to come up with this 360 degree view of this client. Uh, and believe it or not, a lot of banks actually take a couple of days for them to uh, come up with the number of uh, the number which is what is called as a net worth for the private banking client for us we just open up the bank account we know how what worth we are um, all right so we spoke about uh, metadata now we're going to talk about lineage all right uh, lineage is uh, so we, what is metadata metadata is uh, data about the data right uh, so what is lineage lineage is the data about the processes so what are all the different processes uh, that touched the data until it came arrive at this particular destination and that is what is called as a lineage uh, so who would be interested in this one uh, again if, uh, both for audit as well as regulators more and more regulators are interested in this one say for example uh, if you are having something less, like a NRIC in your data set. And uh, uh, regulators would like to know uh what is the hashing algorithm that you used in order to hash your NRIC? Uh, and uh, unless we know which is a process that touched or hashed this uh, NRIC, we wouldn't be able to explain it to them. And so we wanted to uh, sh uh, be able to uh, call out at any point uh, which are the different processes that touched our uh, data in the first place. Uh, that's the lineage tracking. So both uh, lineage and metadata is, is the first piece of the talk that we'll, talk, uh, we'll be talking about, okay? All right, that's it. Uh, so uh, that's the end of the fluff. So we'll go to the demo. Uh, hopefully this should work. Um, so who, who here are actually uh, coming from Hadoop background or who are familiar with Hive um, by any chance? All right, that's, okay, that's good, that's good. Uh, all right, so Hive, uh, just to give a brief overview, um, who are, uh, or who is familiar with Big, BigQuery or Athena? Uh, or, I mean, all of them, Hive, Athena, uh, BigQuery are all the same. Uh, so what they do is that they have, because in big data world, uh, what they do is that we typically store the data as files, right? A any text files or parquet files or whatever richer format, we just store it as files. Um, but, uh, and then we use uh, something like Spark or Hadoop MapReduce or Flink or Beam or whatever it is uh, to process those uh, data uh, in the thing. But, but not many understand what a Spark is, what a uh, MapReduce is. No one wants to, so if you wanted to, if you have a data, uh, say uh, you have a, a, a demographic data, and then you wanted to identify, uh, uh, identify who are all the person names, uh, whose name starts with a T, for example. Uh, you don't want to write a Spark job for that. I mean, you wanted to use the tools that you're familiar with, uh, which is most of the time SQL, right? So you just wanted to write, write a SQL query on top of this data in order to query the uh, query the data. But the data underlying data is a uh, is a file, right? So what do you uh, what do you what are you going to do about it? So Facebook came up with this uh, this tool called Hive. What it does is that uh, it accepts a query. It just uh, Hive is just a SQL parser. It accepts a query, and uh, from the query, it, what it does is that it generates uh, MapReduce programs out of it. And these MapReduce programs can then uh, talk to the file and then retrieve the data from uh, out of it. That's that's all it is. That's all the Hive is. And obviously, because it's a SQL thing, so uh, Facebook was smart enough to come up with uh, with a view of what the table is. What are, uh, we can run a, uh, we can run proper ANSI on top of these uh, these files now. All right. Okay. Uh, that's good. Now, uh, there are two tools that we're going to talk about. Uh, one is uh, Apache Atlas, and this is the most important uh, uh, tool that we're going to talk about. If you're not able to see it from a distance, uh, that's on purpose. Uh, that's, how, that's how I'm going to call it. Um, so uh, we're going to look at this in, uh, in a detailed demo. Don't worry about it. Uh, so, we, so Apache Atlas, on the left side, we can see that there is a, some data set that we have, uh, and we have a bunch of uh, metadata attached to that. Uh, so what does this data mean? And that's the left side of it. And the right side is uh, what we would call as lineage. Uh, say, for example, the original data set was playlist data set, and then we had this processing, some kind of a processing. It could be Spark job, it could be anything. And then it could be even a, a table creation, right? Uh, and then out of that process came two different data sets. So that is, that is the lineage side of it. So when we look at this lineage, we would know that uh, when we're looking at a data set like streams by country, we would be easily able to figure out that uh, the source of this streams by country data set is playlist data set. And uh, the, the way it, it got generated is through using the playlist data pipeline. That's all, that's all there is. Okay, this is, this, is, this is one of the most important tools that we're going to talk about, okay? Uh, we'll be looking at this in detail. Uh, the next 
Um, okay, so um, I forgot to say that. Uh, so we see this, uh, who here are familiar with any kind of graph databases? Uh, Neo4j, anyone? Uh, or, or who is familiar with, uh, there is something that exists call, existing called graph database? And obviously, that's good, that's good, that, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. So a graph are just uh, nodes and edges, I mean, you would have learned in your computer science uh, thing. So, um, so this, this uh, lineage tracking and uh, the metadata store, uh, we can easily store, if, you, if, uh, if you're familiar with something called a Neo4j or any other graph database, this is exactly how it, it would represent. We, we dump the data, we can actually call uh, the data set as a node and another data set called node, and then we just uh, link it together uh, and we call that an edge and whatnot. So uh, the bottom line is that uh, Atlas itself is a, a graph database. Uh, so um, Atlas is actually built on a graph database called Janus Graph, and uh, the underlying data store for Janus Graph uh, is uh, Cassandra or Bigtable or uh, HBase. Uh, we need not know about the internals of it, it's just a, a brief look of how uh, uh, we, we just need to focus on this side of it. We just, all we need to do for uh, metadata governance or metadata and governance is that we need to look on the left side of it. Now we are just looking on the right side, but these are more of the internals of the Atlas. We, uh, we'll be looking at it on the left side shortly. All right. So we have this uh, graph database, and the internally, uh, war, uh, the, the way Atlas stores uh, data is a HBase Cassandra or Bigtable. But, uh, but if, you, if, you, if, you, if you know graph, I mean, we, you would know that it's really hard to search, uh, traverse through every single nodes and edges in order to come up with uh, what your search criteria is. Say, for example, if you're searching for, uh, um, for, for a playlist data set, and the, by the time you type in, I wanted to uh, look at uh, the playlist data set, and then I wanted to look at the column called uh, songs, uh, by the time it comes back, I mean, you would go home and come back. Uh, it, it takes a long time. So what, what Atlas uh, does is that internally, it also uses something called as a Solar or Elastic, which is a full text search engine, and then which, which can give a richer uh, way of querying the data. That's pretty much it. Don't worry about on the left side. But the most important thing that we're interested in is on the left side, side of it. So um, the way that you can push metadata into Atlas uh, is by means of uh, Kafka or calling a REST API. Atlas both exposes the REST API as well as it exposes the Kafka topic. So we can publish uh, our metadata in whatever shape or form it is, uh, and then we convert into uh, Atlas understood format, which we'll be looking at shortly, and then we'll push that metadata into Atlas. All right, that's, that's all good. Okay, um, all right. So now the next, uh, uh, we'll be briefly touching on Ranger because this is a talk about metadata and lineage. We're not talking about Ranger at all. The, the, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm bringing Ranger here is that we can, we'll be looking at it later, uh, we, we can actually enforce security uh, using the metadata itself. Uh, what I mean by that is that, say for example, uh, we have this playlist data set, right? And we, we know that this particular table has some sensitive information. See, let, let's take this example of salaries, okay? Uh, we have the employee salaries, and then uh, we don't want every, everyone to see that table, uh, the, the, the salary uh, amount. But we wanted uh, the finance team alone to see that. And then we can, what we can do is that we can mark this particular data set as sensitive. And then we can, based on this tagging that we have done, we can grant access to uh, various other people saying that uh, this guy, or maybe the CEO, has access to the sensitive data and so on. So this is a, we'll just briefly touch upon this one, okay? Uh, that's it. Uh, Ranger has an interesting architecture. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll look at it in detail, but Ranger is, uh, Ranger is backed not by HBase or Cassandra, it's just a plain old MySQL or uh, any kind of RDBMS database. It could be MySQL, it could be Postgres, or uh, Derby, or, or whatever RDBMS database that you have. Uh, that's it. So when we, uh, we'll be looking at a demo uh, shortly, but uh, what, what, with the help of uh, Ranger, what we can do is that we can declare what is called as a security policy. Uh, this is exactly what I just mentioned. Uh, say, for example, we can say that uh, CEO uh, has access uh, to all the Hive tables, which is the data set, uh, which is tagged with sensitive. No one else has access to this data set. Uh, and that, that we, can, we can declare that in uh, Ranger. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, this is a lot of architecture, and this is, uh, this is a lot to take in. Uh, let's, let's, let's pause a little, and then we'll look at these tools, uh, how, it, uh, how it does in, uh, in, uh, in real world, and then we can, uh, we, we can slowly get to appreciate uh, what happens internally as well, okay? Um, the first demo that we're gonna show, uh, talk about is uh, the Hive. So we, what we're gonna do now is to create 
a hive table, okay? and we are going to call it salaries. Uh, and then uh, uh, on the left side, we have the finance department uh, who has access to everyone's salaries, uh, I guess. Uh, and then there is a CEO. Uh, by default, he wouldn't have access to this, uh, these salaries at all. Okay? So let's go and create. Uh, this is the way that you create a hive table is uh, with a plain old uh, database. There's no, no difference there. Create table uh, salaries um, ID int, say name is uh, an employee name is string, and salary is uh, say double maybe. Okay? That's it. Ah, yes. What do you do? Ah, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I need to connect to Hive. And then I'm going to copy this one. Uh, I'm going to create a table, salaries. Uh, the uh, employee ID is uh, int, uh, name is string, and then uh, salary is double. We're good to go. Uh, let's, for the, just, just for the sake of it, uh, we're, just gonna, uh, we're just going to use it. You're not able to see this? Okay, sorry. Um, probably. Ah, I can't do that. Um, so uh, the next thing that we're going to in, uh, insert some values inside it, okay? Um, insert into uh, 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 salaries. Salaries. Uh, the ID of the employee is one. Uh, narcissist, Arun. Uh, and then we have, uh, see, I have, see, uh, I make a lot of money. Uh, all right. Uh, and then, yeah, I missed the syntax. All right, that's it. All right, the insert takes this much, and that's the main reason people don't use Hive. Uh, so, but we can do the select star from, uh, from salaries now, all right? So we have this one, okay? Uh, for, just for the uh, fun of it, we'll also create a view uh, uh, on top of this one. So create view uh, salary view uh, as a select name from uh, salaries, all right? So we created a view, select star from uh, salary view. All right, this is good. So we have created a hive table, we have created a view. Now, let's open up Atlas, all right? Uh, Atlas uh, by default runs on 21,000 if you have installed it. Uh, for Hortonworks, it comes default. Uh, I'm not sure Cloudera comes with Cloudera Navigator, but Atlas, Atlas is an uh, Apache project, so you're free to install it anywhere. I uh, have it installed on uh, AWS at the moment. All right, I'm going to log this in, and then I'm going to search for uh, hive table. And then uh, uh, that's a whole lot. Uh, we have a name equal to salaries. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's the demo side of it. I mean, <laughs> All right. So I have this uh, new Hive table uh, called salaries. And I can see that uh, all the metadata has been captured magically. So you can see that uh, the ID, name, and salary has been captured. Uh, the database is default database. Uh, the owner is finance, which we already know. Uh, and then it's a managed table. If, uh, if you're familiar with Hive, it's, it's, it's a Hive internally managed table. Okay? And we can actually look into the columns, uh, salary, and we can see that, okay, salary is a column of the table salaries, uh, and it has a, a type of double. Okay? Um, the next, oh, the most important thing why I created a view uh, is this. All right, when we go into the lineage side of it, uh, we can see that uh, we have this hive table called salaries, and then uh, we also have the hive view called uh, the the hive view, which is also. Uh, uh, tagged as hive table, but we have the salary view as well coming here. And we can clearly see that the process, uh, process that it ran in order to create this hive, uh, hive view is something called as a create view. This is an exact command that we wrote, right? So that's it. We can actually go into the salary view and we can double click this one. Oh man. Uh, double click this one and we can see that uh, salary view is here and then we can see the properties of the view too. Uh, we can see that we just picked up name from the hive table, right? Uh, so we have the name here and then uh, 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 we can also see that uh, the view expanded text is, uh, this is weird, uh, it actually takes uh, salaries, uh, the, the name column from the salaries and then it, it shows it up. So we, we managed to capture uh, uh, metadata as well as the lineage of the hive table. Now this is, uh, this seems something uh, Magical, right? But it's it's actually not. It's 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 really funny if you look at it, uh, how it works. Uh, let's look at how it works. In, in fact, and the reason why I'm going to show this one is that um, uh, why uh, why I would like to show how it works internally is that uh, because a lot of people believe that Atlas is actually a tool for the Hadoop framework. It it's necessarily not. It's just it's just a metadata management framework, and then we can actually uh, use it to uh, uh, expand to anything else. Okay. Uh, manage any data. All right, so the way that it works is that Hive has this construct called as a, a 
hooks. Okay, uh, so the hook by way of hooks we can actually subscribe to any of the DDL operations within Hive, uh, and uh, the way that you could implement your own hook is by uh, overriding uh, this, uh, implementing this interface called execute with hook context. All right, that's it. And then we, all we need to do is to implement this function called run, and that's it. And once you implement the run function, you get access to all the DDL operations within Hive, and we can subscribe to this DDL operations now. And this is the receiving side of it. Now we wanted to push uh, push this metadata into Atlas, right? The sending side of it looks like something like this. Um, we have something called as an Atlas hook. Uh, Atlas hook is an abstract class, and all that Atlas hook uh, provides is uh, something called as a notify entities. It's a it's a it's a function which is uh, which is a wrapper over the Kafka producer API. Uh, remember here that we saw that uh, the way that you could push uh, data inside uh, Atlas. Uh, which is on the other side is by using the Kafka interface, right? So Atlas already provides you with something called as Atlas hook, and all we need to do is to call this notify entities. That's it. All right. Now we need to marry these together, right? So uh, we take uh, the Hive hook, and then uh, we subscribe to the events from the Hive, and then we take the Atlas hook, and we call the notify entities. And then uh, we, internally, then we can actually push uh, data to, uh, to Atlas itself. But uh, the good people of Atlas was, uh, was really kind enough to ha actually have this implemented already for us. So we don't need to actually write this up. Uh, so in the Apache Atlas project, we can actually see a class called Hive Hook, which implements both execute with hook context, which is a, uh, which is a Hive Hook, and then we have the Atlas Hook. So the Hive Hook has this function called run, all right? And then because we have already extended from Atlas Hook, uh, what it does is that uh, with the help of run, it subscribes to various DDL operations here. And at the end of it, what it does is that it just calls the notify entities of the Atlas hook. And that's, that's how I uh, automatically published uh, the information, uh, the metadata into Atlas, and that's it. And there's nothing um, strange about it, okay? Now, this is all good, and this is Hive, right? Again, um, uh, we saw the code, uh, and th we, this, uh, this is just Hive, but we really wanted to say, for assume, assume that we have uh, in-memory database, so if, uh, we have in-memory data in Aluxio, maybe, or Hazelcast, for that, for that sake, but we wanted to actually have uh, the metadata stored for those data sets inside Atlas as, as well. How do you go about doing that? Uh, and uh, we, know, we now know the basic constructs, right? So we know all we need to do is to um, uh, use the Atlas hook, and then call the notify entities. We have to prepare the data in such a way, and then call the notify entities, and the data gets published in Atlas. That's it. Or we, we know that there is another option uh, wherein we can call the REST API, correct? So uh, we can, uh, what we can do is that we can construct the Atlas entities and call the REST API, and then let it publish there. That's it. Now let's do that. All right. Uh, for the sake of this example, we are going to talk about uh, the, the Spotify data set. So, for example, uh, we have this uh, meta, uh, data set called user ID. Uh, we have track ID. Uh, what is the stream? So, so if you're playing a song, uh, who is the user who played the song? What is the name of the song? Uh, how long did he play? And where is he coming from? What device did he use? And whatnot. Okay. And uh, uh, this is actually a real case, uh, in fact. All right. So uh, the pipeline that you're going to build is that we have this plain vanilla uh, data set, and then we are going to use uh, the playlist pipeline. Uh, we, we are going to call it a playlist pipeline. And then from there, we are going to generate uh, two different data sets, which is streams by city and streams by country. Okay? But this is a dummy data set. There's no real data set exists. I just wanted to uh, showcase how we can actually push metadata inside it. Okay? That's it. All right. So uh, I'm going to show this one. Uh, th this is, uh, I, I can give you the URL. The URLs are at the, at the end of the slide as well. Uh, so we have this in-memory data set. Uh, uh, I've just declared what are the var various attributes which I wanted Atlas to, be, uh, Atlas to capture. Okay? We have the data shape. We have the source system. We have a bunch of data inside that. We'll be looking at it in UI. Okay? We have this data set. And then uh, we have the user, and then we have the pipeline thing. Okay, but that's, this is all boring stuff. This is uh, if you're familiar with uh, Scala, it's it's just a case class. If you're familiar with Java, a case class is nothing but a Java bean. Okay, it's just a plain um, anemic Java bean. Okay, but this is what we are interested in. We, I've just cooked up some random data. So what I have at the moment in front of me is just a plain vanilla main application. There is nothing that we need to do. Uh, that, what, I, what I wanted to showcase is that there is very minimal that we need to do in order to publish our metadata into uh, Atlas. So there is no excuse for us to not to do governance on the data that we have. That's, that's the point I'm trying to drive at. Okay? 
So we have, uh, we have a bunch of uh, data sets. Uh, I'll just show you the main one. We have the pipeline. Uh, the pipeline accepts one input, which is a source data set, that, like we saw in the picture. Uh, we have two outputs. One is uh, songs by city and songs by country, uh, which is exactly what we saw here. Right? We just wanted to uh, simulate this one. That's good. Um, so we can actually run this one. Uh, all right. Now, this is not exciting. Um, I'm using a REST interface. And how am I uh, doing that? It's all published now. Okay. It's all published now. Okay. So the way I'm doing it is that uh, I have this, uh, I showed you the models, I showed you the fixtures, but this model is just a Java bean. How would Atlas understand a Java bean, right? Uh, and then I have this fixtures, which is all Java bean populated, uh, populated data. And the way I'm doing it is that I need to uh, convert all these Java beans into something called as a referenceable. Referenceable is a class within Atlas. Uh, is a class within Atlas. All I need to do is to populate this uh, uh, this class called referenceable. And referenceable uh, looks very much like a map. Uh, so all we need to do is that to, for a key, uh, what is the value? What, for a key, what is the value? And so on. Uh, for this data set, I'm actually uh, pushing the key and a value. And that's it. Uh, for data, this is there for the data set. Uh, this is for the field, and this is for the process. Okay. Uh, all right. And then finally, I'm just uh, using this uh, REST interface uh, in order to push it to Atlas. Uh, the one thing which you need to know is that uh, there is the, because there is, uh, there's a, quite a bit of code, and it took uh, actually a couple of days for me to figure it out. I mean, I, I wouldn't expect you to understand the entire thing. Uh, but what I really wanted to showcase is that uh, with a couple of classes, we can actually push the metadata into Atlas. That's, that's exactly what we wanted to uh, drive at. And in fact, there are uh, tools, something like uh, su such as Spline or uh, Spark uh, Atlas Connector, which actually does the exact same thing. What it does is that, uh, see, uh, assume if it's a Spark job, what it does is that, uh, given a DAG, uh, it, it extracts the individual stages from the DAG. And for each of the stage, uh, it just calls an Atlas uh, uh, um, Kafka call, and then populates those uh, metadata for every single intermediate data set into Atlas. Uh, so that's something which you can explore. But a Spark uh, Atlas connector is very um, it's still maturing. It's not yet mature. But spline is a little more mature. But uh, but I found uh, the uh, the way that it populated the data, the, the names of the data set is is really cryptic. So, but but we know that we can easily uh, spawn off uh, our own uh, way of uh, documenting the metadata. That's it. Okay. All right. Good. Um, all right. The last thing which I wanted to show you is uh, the tag-based security. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's let's uh, we have this. Uh, we created a new table, and then we wanted to. Uh, now the CEO would like to see uh, how the, uh, the all the salaries of the employees. Okay. So uh, how do we go about doing that? Um, um, okay. We'll just show this one. Okay. So this is the CEO, right? So he has this, uh, we, we saw this table that we created as salaries. And what we're going to do is that we're going to do, ouch. You're kidding me. Ah, the demo. Ouch. That's bad. Um, All right. All right. Select uh, a star from C uh, from salaries, right? See, this is a CEO guy that we are logged in, and he is not able to see the salaries now. And uh, remember, I told you that we can actually use the metadata that we created in order to enforce security. Okay, and that's that's where the ranger uh, comes into play. Now, what we're going to do with from Atlas is that to, uh, we have the salaries. Uh, we have the salary stable, and we can see something called as a classification. And the, the class oh, uh, the classification is nothing but tags, okay, that we can attach to a data set. Now, uh, the way that we can create a classification is by using this classification tab. In this case, I'm going to create a new tag called fa fin sensitive, okay, and this is financially uh, sensitive. All right. And then we have created a new tag already. Now we we go back to this uh, salary uh, table, and then we attach this tag uh, to this particular uh, data set. And then now we have this fin sensitive. All we have done is to attach uh, a tag to the salaries, but we have not given any access to the uh, CEO for this data set at all. Now, for that, we need to go into Ranger. All right? uh, 
Uh, Ranger is another uh, Hadoop-based security framework, but uh, it need not be uh, Hadoop specific. Okay, uh, we'll look at that shortly. Okay. Now, Ranger has the uh, ability to actually manage security for a variety of components, but what we are keen about right now is to manage the security uh, using tag-based policies. Okay, so we go into the tag-based policy, and then we're going to create a new policy. Okay, uh, which is financially sensitive policy, uh, and then we are going to uh, we just type in fin, and then the, you can see that the fin sensitive got synced. This, this is a tag which we created in Atlas, and the Ranger automatically uh, got that captured. We'll see that shortly. Uh, the, way that, okay, uh, the way that this tag got synced with Atlas is using the same Kafka topic that we're using for publishing as well. Okay? Uh, it's, it's a little different. Okay. All right, now we are going to grant this user. Uh, allow condition is CEO user uh, would be uh, for a component Hive, we are just going to give a uh, for the component hive. We are going to give him select access. Okay, so what it, what this entire policy means is that uh, for all the components in hive that has tagged with this fin sensitive tag, uh, please grant access to the CEO. That's all it means. Okay, and we can add multiple users to this one. That's it, and then uh, we can add. That's it. And now we can uh, hopefully the demo works. Okay. Uh, give me one second. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so we have the salaries. Uh, 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 we now the CEO is able to see the salaries. That's it. That's it. So we can. We didn't uh, explicitly say. We didn't explicitly map uh, what table that uh, the CEO wants to give uh, get access to. We just said that uh, we, uh, whatever whatever uh, table uh, which is tagged with us uh, with the fin sensitive, the CEO has access now. All right. Okay. Cool. Uh, the way that it works is uh, using this one. Okay, so Atlas, uh, whenever it it creates a tag, it syncs up with Ranger, uh, so that uh, the Ranger is aware of uh, all the tags that has been created inside Atlas. And then, whenever there is a user request into Hive, uh, Hive has this uh, has this ability to ha extend to Ranger sub has. Ranger support. We can actually, it's just a Ranger support is nothing but a jar which we need to copy into Hive. Uh, and then uh, uh, from whenever a user request uh, uh, a table access, what, what Hive could do is that it intercepts a user request and from there uh, it just consults with the Ranger uh, with, and consults if there is any policy that is existing uh, for, uh, which can grant user access, uh, access to this particular resource that the user is looking for. Okay? Uh, to be honest with you, we can actually extend uh, this Ranger authorizer uh, outside the Hadoop world. Uh, in fact, there is a, there's a recent blog post which I wrote which we can use a plain old HTTP service and use a Ranger for authorizing it. Uh, but this is not relevant to the talk, as the thing says. Uh, that's good. All right, just to summarize, uh, we saw how to track um, uh, lineage of Hive using Atlas. Uh, we did see briefly about uh, what are the Atlas internals. Uh, we specifically saw how Hive and Atlas links together through the Kafka topic, and then uh, we have the Atlas hook, and then it publishes to Atlas. Uh, and then we also saw how we can extend uh, Atlas outside Hadoop. If you're really cu curious about how do we can actually publish uh, metadata of Atlas, uh, uh, metadata of any other resource into uh, Atlas, please let me know. Uh, I, I can help you with that. Uh, and then we also finally saw about what uh, the tag-based security, right? That we can easily enforce uh, security on uh, using Ranger uh, using Atlas tags. Okay. That's it. So this is the, the main point is that there is no excuse for no data governance. I mean, they, we just can't go crazy with the data I mean, because sooner or later, um, uh, soon after we have a little more than 100 tables, or uh, uh, it's it's very hard to manage the entire data set. Okay, that's it. All right, that's uh, that's the end of the first discussion. Now we talk about the second one. Okay, this is uh, this is this is very close to my heart, and this is, uh, I really feel strongly about the data formats. Okay, uh, so in this data formats and uh, schema evolution talk, we're going to talk about uh, actually we are just going to talk about two specific data formats, which is Avro and Parquet, and we're going to use Thrift and Protobuf just to set this. Uh, uh, space, I mean, uh, set the stage for uh, what these data formats are about and why you should appreciate uh, Avro and Parquet. Okay, uh, and what are the different advantages you get with Avro and Parquet? All right. So Thrift is a uh, Thrift came from Facebook uh, and uh, Thrift open source uh, th uh, Facebook open source Thrift. Uh, and the reason why Thrift came about is that. Uh, uh, 
Facebook has a, has a strong engineering culture, uh, and they don't want uh, to force engineers to use the same language. Uh, so what they what they did was to come up with something called as a thrift. So you uh, when you when you wanted to define a, a new service, all all you get to do is to write a contract, uh, saying that okay, uh, when I say contract, what it means is that say for example, if you're onboarding a new user, uh, so add a new user or delete a new user or retrieve a new user. This is a contract, right? This is a this is a regular uh, uh, contract that you write even for a REST interface. Uh, once you have a contract, then you run it by a thrift compiler in order to generate both the client code and the server-side code. This is, this is something which you do with Swagger or anything like that as well. Uh, but the most important part is that you can actually generate your client or the server code in any language that you like. And these are the languages actually thrift supports at this point. Uh, and there are more languages which is, which is coming up as well. But we are not going to talk about the RPC. We're just going to talk about the entity. Say, for example, if you have a REST interface for adding a new client, what is uh, and then you say assume that you you're passing a JSON. What is that? What is the entity? The 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 uh, the user entity that you're passing. The user has a name and age and whatnot for onboarding that. That entity is what we're going to talk about, and that is the data, right? The others are just services. That is the data that you're uh, that you're trying to persist. So in order to, uh, the way that you can define uh, thrift entity is by using this, uh, uh, this format. Uh, it's called uh, struct, uh, tweet thrift, and then you, you have a bunch of numbers in the front, and then you have uh, whether the column is required or optional, and you have a data type and a column name. All right? And uh, when you wanted to generate a thrift, uh, when you wanted to uh, write um, uh, a thrift, uh, uh, thrift uh, you want to write it as a thrift binary, what you typically do is that you take this entity, you run it by a thrift compiler, and you generate uh, language bindings, right? In this case, I have generated a Java binding. And uh, uh, when you, what you can see is that from, from the looks of it, you can actually figure out how a thrift, uh, thrift actually does it. And let's uh, hang on with me here. So we have uh, int 64-bit uh, integer, and then we can see that 64-bit integer actually maps to something called a 0a within thrift world. And then we have this 0, 1, which is a field tag here. And uh, the next 0, 1 is, is a value here. And then we can see that uh, the next one, we have i64, which is a 64-bit int, which is 0a again. And then we have the field tag 2, which is 2 here. And then we have 7b, which is hexadecimal 423, and so on. So the way that thrift actually persists your data is, uh, is one field by one field. Uh, and it's very obvious in the way that it uh, actually persists, OK? Um, the one thing that you need to note here is that we are not using this uh, final uh, column name at all, target, or ID, or date, or user, or whatnot. Uh, and the reason is that Thrift doesn't care about uh, any of your uh, uh, column names at all. All it just cares about is a field tag, and then uh, the data itself, and uh, what do you call it? the value itself. The data, the field tag, and the, uh, and the data type, sorry. Uh, and protobuf is, is, uh, came from Google. and. Uh, Protobuf has, has an even more compressed format. Okay, uh, it uses uh, it, the, the structure looks very much like thrift in the sense that the field tag uh, goes to the end of it instead of the beginning in case of thrift. But it looks very much similar to that. Uh, you can not, you can also not see uh, required or optional in, in Protobuf, and the reason is that uh, all, in Protobuf Protocol three, uh, all fields are uh, optional now. Okay. And uh, it has a very uh, interesting mechanism to uh, actually merge your uh, uh, data type and a field tag into one single go. Uh, the one thing that we need to know about thrift and protobuf is that uh, even with protobuf, we have to generate uh, Java classes or any other uh, language bindings that you want your, that you require to. Uh, Say so this could be C, Go, whatnot, and stuff. So that's the most important thing. The reason why, uh, why we are discussing about this is that uh, imagine if you have a table if you have a table like this, and then you're adding a new column to this particular table called, say, for example, name and age is your original table, and then you decide to add uh, a last name to that particular table. Uh, now, if you're storing your data using protocol buff or uh, thrift, what you need to do is that uh, you need to open up this structure, add that entry brand new, and, you need to, and in order for your clients to use, you have to regenerate the entire Java class or Scala class or uh, Python in order to populate the values into this one. So this is a manual process, and no one likes this. So and, and, um, pretty much all the data is, uh, when, you're, when you're building a data lake of sorts, uh, most of the data is fluid. You can't dictate the schema of your source at any point. Uh, and that is the main thing that we, uh, that we would like to, uh, the, the why we are discussing about Thrift and Protobuf before we are talking about Avro and Parquet. Okay? 
The one other important thing is that because we saw that uh, uh, Thrift and Protobuf identifies your uh, column names, uh, columns by name of field tags and not by column names, the one important thing that we need to watch out for is to reuse of the field tag itself. So assume that you have a version one. Um, in, the, in the age old past, uh, you have a version one of your schema wherein uh, you have ID date user text, but you also have something called as a, a target column uh, which has this field tag of one. Okay? For some reason, you retired this uh, field tag, you don't need this uh, target field at all, uh, but then after like a few years, you decide to reuse the same tag for something called as an age column. Okay? So now what happens is that when you're using, when you're retrieving data, whatever values that you populated in the previous version uh, on the target will just get carried over as the data for age now. You see that? So if you have a target one and you're populating a target as one here, and then after a while you're populating uh, for the age, you're populating the value as 30, and then you, 30 comes in. But when you're retrieving the data, what happens is that one comes as age carried over. So we have to be really careful not to use a previously existing tag uh, at all in case of protobuf. Uh, and the way that, uh, that you can uh, work around this part is that you can actually, whenever you retire a, a field tag or a, retire a column, uh, you have to mark this field tag as reserved, or you explicitly uh, mark this column name as obsolete underscore, so that the engineer knows when they are populating the value, they know that this column is obsolete, so they, don't, uh, they won't use it anymore. Okay? Um, just to summarize, uh, predominantly, Thrift and Protobuf is used for RPC, uh, well, but, but uh, for building a data lake, uh, we don't use Thrift or Protobuf unless you're Google, uh, because Google actually uses Protobuf as a storage format as well. Uh, and columns are identified not by name, but by field tags, uh, which we already saw. Uh, and uh, we, should, we should be really careful not to use a previously existing tag, which we just saw, uh, that uh, the previously existing values would be carried over as the currently existing field tag, field tag values. And every time, this is the most important bit, uh, every time we have a schema evaluation, every time we add a new column, we have to make sure that we, we add that column. There's a manual effort involved. There's some person who has to go and look into the structure and see whether uh, this field tag has already been used. Uh, this, this, because this field tag could be any, any random number, right? We have to check whether the field tag has already been used, and then, uh, then they have to generate uh, the language bindings, and then ask everyone to generate the language bindings as well. That's a, that's a hassle in the first place. This, is, this goes back to the SOAP world and web services world, okay? All right, uh, now the most important part, the Avro and Parquet. Uh, I'm very excited about this one. So, so Avro is row-oriented, okay? Uh, the, the more, uh, Avro is a data format which is, which is pretty much th uh, one of the most popular data format because it supports a variety of uh, schema evaluation in the first place. And the way that Avro uh, writes data is row by row. So you have a bunch of, uh, you have a table like this, and the way that it writes data row by row uh, is that it writes a row uh, first row first, and then they're followed by the second row and stuff, which is which is really optimal. So, as in, in in case of a streaming data set or you have a large data set, you just read the data data, and then as and when the data arrives, you just keep appending to the file immediately. So, the write is amazingly faster uh, um, in Avro. Okay. And the way that uh, that you would declare, uh, just like Thrift, the, the, the way that you would declare an Avro schema is, looks something like this. Uh, no one remembers this stuff. Uh, every time we write a new schema, we just look it up from Google, and then we just try to edit it. Uh, this is a way that you do it. So you have a name and the type, data type, and you have a class name. And one important thing that you can uh, remember from uh, notice from here is that there is no field tags. Uh, there is no numbers attached to the Avro at all. And the reason is that uh, Avro identifies a column by name, just like human beings. Uh, we identify a column by name, and just like that, uh, Avro identifies a column by name as well. That's good. Now, we have the schema, we, ha we know how the data is getting written. How does the Avro binary format look like? Like this. So what it does is that when you write an Avro file uh, um, uh, in your binary, what happens is that it appends your schema in the header, uh, and then uh, the brown that you can see is, uh, is the data number one, row number one, and the row number two after that, okay? So this, this one is a sync marker, which will, uh, if you're curious, I'll, I'll talk about it later. Uh, but we, we have the row written sequentially, okay? That's, mo that's the most important thing. And uh, we, the one thing that I didn't talk about is that uh, there is, uh, in terms of protobuf or thrift, uh, I told that we have to generate bindings uh, for, uh, we have to, what I, what I mean by binding is that we need to run it by a thrift compiler or protobuf compiler in order to generate a Java class or Python class. Uh, but in terms of Avro, we don't need to at all. 
uh, it's optional. We can generate classes, but no one does that. I mean, not not many actually do it. Uh, so what we can do is that something uh, we can use something called a generic record and then read the values uh, from Avro. And generic record has this. Uh, if you're familiar with map dot entry in a hash map, uh, it looks very similar to that. Uh, generic record just has a, a name and a and a value so that's it so and in in which case for every single column uh, uh, column we have a column name and a value so we can identify every single cell uh, using the column and the value so that's exactly what a generic a generic record is okay so all we need to know from this slide is that uh, we don't need to generate uh, bindings for avro at all okay and this is a little tricky so uh, and this is this is amazing as well in terms of Avro. Uh, say I assume that you have a version one of your uh, data set uh, wherein you have uh, the column uh, you using a column name called uh, name. Okay, you have a name and then age. That's your version one of your schema, and then you have only persist the data according to that. And then finally you, you realize oh, the name is not just enough. I need to capture first name and last name. All right, uh, and so you change, go back and change the schema uh, to add first name and last name. Now when you're doing first name and last name and you're trying to retrieve data using that. Uh, the old data is completely gone, right? And so what you would typically want to do is that you need to, you, you would like to map the first name to the, the values which has been already populated for name column, that's it. So uh, you, you can easily do that using something called as aliases. So you can say that this is a way that you, could, you would declare in your schema, you have a first name, and then uh, you would say that alias is name, so when you're actually querying it up, uh, it will look at the data. If there is a first name, it will fetch all the values for the first name. If there is a name column uh, in that, if there is no first name, then it will fetch the values for the name column, which is exactly what we want, right? So which Avro, uh, this is backward compatible, which means that you can read the data from the uh, previous world, okay? Uh, the general practice that you would do uh, in order when you're writing a new schema uh, or is that uh, you would, uh, uh, in order to support backward and forward compatibility, this is a rule of thumb. Uh, one is that you, when you declare a column, you make it optional all the time. Uh, you don't make it required because you never know when you're going to retire that column. You make it optional. At the same time, provide a default value as well. Okay, That's, that's most important when you declare an average schema. Uh, that's the summary. So we have uh, Avro stores data row by row, which we already know. It fields are matched by name. This is the most important thing that we need to know. There's no bindings required. That's, that's the most important part of Avro. We don't need to generate uh, bindings at all. Uh, and uh, Avro is well suited for select star. If you're retrieving all or most of the data from your data set, Avro is the best format out there. Uh, and in fact, uh, Avro is predominantly because uh, when, you're, when you're loading a lot of data and you're writing it sequentially, you're reading from some other different source and you're writing it, uh, uh, writing it uh, to a file, uh, Avro has this uh, amazing ability to write uh, amazingly fast as well. It just dumps the data in real time most of the time. Uh, all right. And then the final um, data format that we're going to talk about is Parquet. And I, uh, with Avro, I spoke about select star, right? Uh, the, that, that's very important as well. Some, sometimes what you do is that uh, you do an ETL job, in which case Avro becomes a most uh, powerful uh, data format, of, uh, if you will. Uh, in terms of Parquet, uh, we, Parquet, we predominantly use it for analytics. Okay? And we'll see uh, why that is the case as well. Uh, Parquet is column oriented. Uh, uh, so, some, some vendor earlier in uh, 2006, they, they told that the tables have turned. And the, and the reason is this. So assume that you have a, a row, okay? You have a bunch of rows, and you wanted to encode that as a, um, encode that to the data file. That, uh, in terms of Parquet, what you go about doing that is that you take the first column, and then you transpose it and write it. You take the second column, you transpose it and write it. You just, you just do it like this. So uh, what happens is that you can, you can uh, if you wanted to fetch one single column value, all you need to do is that to go to the beginning of the column and then you read it sequentially until the end of the column and then you can get it done with. Uh, this, this comes in handy, uh, which we'll be discussing later. This comes in handy when you're looking at specific columns or you're aggregating based on specific columns, okay? Um, now you know that you wanted to uh, take uh, one single, uh, you wanted to take a group of, um, uh, you wanted to take one single column and transpose it one by one, right? Uh, this is all good, but if you have one terabyte of data, uh, how would you go about doing that? You can't take one terabyte of data into memory and then take one single column out of it and then you, you transpose it, right? So you can't do that. So what you, uh, what, uh, what you typically do is that you take a bunch of rows, uh, uh, you take a bunch of rows and then you uh, take one specific column and transpose it one by one. And this bunch of rows uh, is what is called as a row group uh, in, in Parquet world, okay? Uh, it's called Stripe in ORC world, but a row group in Parquet world. 
Okay, and the 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 128 MB uh, the, the 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 number 128 MB is not chosen by accident. Uh, it actually aligns with the uh, HDFS block size, so it's easy for us to uh, take one thread and process one single file, and that's a whole idea. Okay, and once you have the row group, uh, you. Uh, you not only write the row group, what you what you then do it is that uh, you take this particular row group and you attach statistics to that. Okay, uh, when I say statistics, what it means is that you track the minimum value and the maximum value uh, of that particular row group. Say, for example, if you take a bunch of rows uh, in which the uh, the uh, the person name uh, starts with A and ends with D, you just write a statistics uh, at the bottom of the file saying that this particular 128 MB has uh, the, the A as a first minimum value and uh, alpha as a minimum value and uh, Dylan as a, la, uh, uh, as, a, as a maximum value, okay? This is a row group. Now, even within the row group, every, we saw that uh, it takes every single column and then uh, it just writes it uh, sequentially. But even under, uh, under every single column, what it does is that it takes uh, chunks of these columns. I mean, uh, it takes um, very uh, one MB part of these columns, what it, and then calls it pages, and then write statistics to, for that as well. Uh, so that, that, that is very important as well. So uh, the, the reason why we write all these statistics is that, uh, say, uh, you're looking, say, I assume that you have this demographic data set wherein you have name, age, and gender, uh, and you, all you wanted to look up uh, is that you wanted to look up all the persons whose names start with T maybe okay, uh, and then now what happens is that uh, you look at the first row group, which is 128 MB, and you look at it and then say that okay, this minimum. You look at you consult the row group statistics. You see that the minimum va value is A and the maximum value is D, uh, but I'm looking for a uh, for a name called T, which is not there. So. The, what what this reader, which is typically Spark or MapReduce, what this reader would do is that it will just completely ignore uh, this uh, this entire 128 MB altogether. So we don't need to go into the data file and then look at it. Uh, as compared to Avro, wherein you have to go into the file and read every single row and then figure out, apply the predicate that you're looking for. Okay. Now, assume that you have this uh, row group where T is actually present, where T is actually within the minimum and the maximum value, you have the second level of uh, statistics applied. Now you go into the 120 MB, you don't read the entire 120 MB because there is a statistics stored at every single one MB each. So you go for the statistics of one MB each, which is like in a matter of very small uh, kilobytes, uh, then you can skip a lot of the data before even you actually uh, return back the uh, result, okay? And statistics is uh, used exactly for that. So we saw the where clause condition, wherein we actually filter the uh, filter data based on row group statistics and the page statistics. And then we also saw the projection pushed on. The projection is uh, just a select column, a select query, right? Whatever comes after select is this thing, uh, is a projection. So we assume that we have this uh, yellow, which is probably age. All we need to do is that we need to do a hard drive seek to the beginning of this particular uh, column, and then we just we just keep on reading until the end of the column, which is which is very optimal for hard drive reads right now. Okay, and uh, Parquet also supports a variety of compression. We are not going to talk about that now. Um, which means that for large data sets, Parquet actually occupies. Uh, most of the time, it occupies less than 50%. If you have a lot of numerical columns, uh, the compression is even more. Okay. Um, one thing which I wanted to show here is that, say, assume that this is the data that you're actually encoding. We saw the binary format of uh, Thrift. We saw the binary format of uh, Avro. We didn't look at the binary format of Parquet. Assume that this is the two different rows that you're writing on uh, Parquet. Uh, this is how the file looks like. Uh, we just wrote Saturday and Sunday once. But if you look at it, Sunday is written once, twice, and thrice. And you can easily guess why is the case, right? Uh, and the reason is that uh, for row group, it writes, because there are only two column, two column values, uh, it has to be in the minimum or the maximum, right? For row group, it writes it once. The minimum is Saturday and the maximum is Sunday. Uh, and for the page statistics, it writes a minimum is Saturday and maximum is Sunday. And there is all, obviously data uh, wherein you can see data values are Saturday and Sunday. That's all it is. All right. The one thing which I didn't show you here uh, when we were talking about Parquet is that the model of it. I didn't specify how do you define the schema of Parquet. Uh, for Thrift, we saw the struct. Uh, the, the Parquet, we saw the struct. Uh, the protobuf, we saw the struct as well. Uh, we saw a record in terms of Avro, but I didn't show Parquet at all. Uh, the reason is that people don't care about it. Parquet does has an internal scheme uh, object model, but no one cares about it. Because uh, what people do is that predominantly they take uh, their own Avro schema or Thrift schema. One of those, there's a whole lot of schema attached that you can open up this project called Parquet MR. 
and we can see a whole lot of schema that you can actually uh, write your own uh, par data model and then you can use this uh, adapter uh, from parquet mr in order to convert in order to convert into a uh, into a parquet data model internal data model and while reading it automatically does it as well so uh, in in fact you can actually write your own uh, you can use a thrift schema to write a parquet file but you can use a avro schema to read the same parquet file so you can do a, a whole lot of stuff like that i mean if you're really curious about it this code is uh, the end of the repository okay so in order to summarize uh, parquet has a uh, supports a variety of uh, primitive complex and logical data types. Uh, the data model of Parquet is not predominantly used. We use Avro schema in order to write a Parquet file. That's what I'm saying. Okay? Uh, Parquet, if, uh, if you're looking at select specific, selecting specific columns or uh, uh, fetching specific, uh, uh, b you're filtering based on certain predicates or aggregating, uh, then Parquet is the best format to go. Uh, but, the, but we do know that uh, writes are um, slower. Uh, it's, it's not miserably slower like the sloth, but it's, it's slower than, uh, definitely slower than Avro, okay? Um, that's one thing. Um, so if, you, if you're curious about the, uh, the, uh, the repositories, uh, the, the, first thing, uh, the first thing is where you can, um, uh, I have this main program wherein I, I publish the metadata or atlas, that's the first one. You can, uh, the second and the third is where you can actually uh, uh, use Ranger for, uh, for what do you call, uh, for uh, authorizing your uh, HTTP request, HTTP service. I just wrote a archive HTTP service and then we can use Ranger in order to authorize uh, uh, the uh, authorize using Ranger. The f last one is the data format Scala. I, I, I meddle around a lot around Thrift, Protobuf, and all the variety of data formats. The code is a little ugly, uh, but, uh, but yeah, you, f you, you, f you feel free to uh, have a look at it. All right, uh, just to summarize, uh, the most important thing that we wanted to know is that Thrift and Protobuf, we don't use it for storage. We use it for RPC. Uh, for Avro is row-oriented. We know faster writes and select. Uh, Parquet is uh, slower writes, but uh, we can do a lot of analytics based on that. Uh, so the, but, but it's not Avro versus Parquet. It's most of the time Avro and Parquet. Uh, the way I've seen in the organization, it's both Avro and Parquet. What people do is that they take the data from uh, different data sets. Uh, they load it into Avro, uh, which they call as a staging layer. And most of the time, the staging layer uh, they use it for consumption as well. But then if you're, if you're looking at specific analysis or if you're, if you're giving, uh, giving the data to uh, data, data scientists or uh, giving to your analysts, then you typically take subset of that data and then convert it into Parquet and then you, you give it for serving. Uh, this is, uh, or even um, uh, uh, sometimes Parquet can be uh, used um, in the same place as ORC as well. Okay. Uh, just as a final summary, uh, we are done with the talk. Uh, uh, we saw how meta, uh, we can use Atlas and Ranger for metadata and lineage tracking. Uh, we also saw, uh, saw the importance of Parquet and uh, Avro uh, for storage formats. And that's, that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.